Do you have any old family photos that you'd like to preserve and restore? Well, then it's time to fire up your scanner because I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks on how to restore your old photos to their original glory, like this one, using Luminar Neo. I'm Darlene with Digital Photo Mentor, and if you want to learn more about photo editing, you're in the right place. So let's get started restoring some old photos. These are the images I'm going to be using to demonstrate photo restoration in this tutorial. They belong to my husband's family and they were found on the original homestead in the Canadian prairies. So we're in the process of documenting the old photos and restoring them. Even if you are not a photographer or into photo editing, but you have old photos that you want to fix up, you can do this if you follow my steps and use Luminar Neo. It's the photo editing software that I recommend for absolute beginners. It's much more user friendly and easy to use than any other products on the market, in my opinion. If you need to purchase Luminar Neo, I'll put a link for you in the description area below. And remember to use my discount code DPM10 to get 10% off when you check out. I'm gonna show you several different techniques and things to use on your images depending on the challenge of each particular image. So I'm going to use different ones to demonstrate different techniques. The first thing I wanna show you is cropping. If you are using a scanner to get your images into the computer, they should be straight, meaning there's no distortion to the shape. But if they're not exactly straight, we can fix that using the crop tool in Luminar Neo. You can see that this one is a little bit crooked. You also want to get any of the white edges off because when we're doing the editing and we want to check the histogram, it's going to throw the graph off to have the white edge. So the first thing we want to do is correct the tilt a little bit. So I'm just going to rotate it visually until I can see that it looks pretty straight or as close as I can get. Then you need to change the ratio to free form so that you can crop it to a different shape because you can see that the shape of the image is different than the shape of the overall scan. Now I can just bring it in to crop off the white, make sure we get rid of all of it. And then I'll double check that I've got it straight and we've got all the edges removing all the white. So to accept the crop, you just have to hit return or you can click here to apply it. I'm going to hit return on my keyboard. Now that I can see the crop applied, I missed a little bit up here at the top. So I just have to open the crop tool again and just come down a little bit more to make sure I get that last bit of white removed. That looks better. So this is what I recommend you do first before you do any other editing. Crop and straighten the image and remove any of the white borders. So I'm going to do that on this image as well. Notice I need to change the crop ratio, the aspect ratio, so I can bring it in from the bottom. Make sure I get rid of all the white parts. Next, we come to a decision. In this case, the image goes all the way to the far right here, but there's a part of the image here that looks like it's been damaged. So I could crop it just to get rid of the white as I did on the other image, or do we really need this whole back part of this image? It doesn't really add to the story and simply by cropping in tighter, I can eliminate having to fix that damaged part of the image. There's no people or anything important there, so I'm just going to crop it out. So that's a conscious decision that you have to make as to where to crop further into the image if you want to get rid of any of the damaged bits. So I'm just going to hit enter to accept the crop. The next issue we're going to address, you can see clearly on this image, it's faded. This is a really common problem with old photos. If they're not stored properly, they will fade and lose contrast. So we're going to use the tools in Luminar Neo to bring some of that back. There's a few different ways to do that. I'm going to start with the develop tool and I'll show you why. The best way to do this is to use the curves. Make sure when you're doing your editing that you have the histogram open. If it's not showing, like so, just go up to the View menu and click Show Histogram. Make sure you see it in grayscale like this and not a color. If you see a color, 
just click it until you get back to just gray. This is an overall histogram. If you're seeing red, it's only giving you a histogram of the red tones of the image. And yes, this is actually a color image, even though the original is black and white, because it was scanned in full color. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now that we're looking at the histogram, you can see it here, but you can also see it in the curves itself. We're missing this whole left section of the graph, and that's where the shadows and the blacks live. So the quickest way to fix that is to pull this left slider, this is right below the curve, make sure you're on the first one, on the gray one, until the histogram or the graph starts to meet the edge of where the curve is. You can still see there's a little bit more distance to go, so I'm gonna go a little farther. And when I get to here, I'm going to turn on the clipping warnings. Now there's two ways to do that. You can click the little circle up here on the histogram, in the blacks and the whites, or you can simply press J on your keyboard. See it turn them off and J back on. The clipping warnings will help you to know when you've got black, pure black, and then overly black, meaning losing some detail. So I'm gonna go a little farther and you can see I start to get clipping here indicated by these blue markings. So that's good. I'm gonna come it back just a tiny bit once I've got the histogram roughly adjusted, I'm gonna tuck in the white a little bit as well. I'm gonna close curves, and then I'm gonna use the sliders. The reason that I started with curves is you can go farther with curves than you can with the black and the white sliders. So do curves first, then come back to the sliders. Now I'm gonna take blacks a little farther. I'm gonna bring shadows down. So shadows is this area in the graph that's not quite pure black, but really dark. And I'm hoping to pick up some of these areas here. Okay, I'm going a little darker, and then it becomes a dance. Maybe I don't want quite so much black after I've lowered the shadows. Remember exposure increases or affects midtones. So as I do that, it pulls the whole graph one way and then the other. So if I increase it a little bit, you'll notice that we've got clipping in the highlights now in this upper left corner, and the blacks are gone. So I can correct the highlights with this slider, and we can add some more blacks back in. So every time you pull one slider, you may have to go back and adjust one that you've already done. So this is what I call the dance of photo editing you have to kind of play back and forth until you find the happy medium between all the sliders. So what I'm looking for here is that I've got some nice contrast. Maybe I want to just come to the top with the white so I'm almost clipping. If you want to see the before and after, hold down the backslash key. Let's turn the clipping off. Before and after again. So we've already enhanced the contrast a great deal. One more thing I'm going to do in here before we leave the develop tool is just increase the sharpness a little bit. I'm gonna bring this masking slider up to about 70 because what that does is it keeps the sharpening effect off of the large areas, so areas that are smooth in the image. So that would be like his coat and the sky and the house. And then I'll bring the sharpening up a little bit more. I almost always check off defringe because why not? I wanna make sure there's no extra fringe happening here. And if we get some noise, if we zoom in, we can have a look and see if there's any noise. When you sharpen, you end up picking up some noise as well. So I might increase the luminosity, noise reduction, just a tiny bit. So again, overall, this is a good start just using the develop tool. Let's move on and check another tool. Before I leave this one though, there's one other slider in develop that can be useful. I might come back and apply that one selectively though, but let's try it. And that is the smart contrast slider. Okay, see what it does? Now you can see when I dial this down that there is some color here. It's kind of a bluish tint. So we could actually correct that while we're here. In the color tab, we're still inside develop, click on the eyedropper, and then just click on anywhere. In this case, the sky and it should neutralize that color. That's closer. 
So smart contrast, in this case, I don't want to apply it overall. I'm going to come back and show you how to apply it selectively just to parts of the image. So for now, I'm just going to reset that one. Close the develop tool. The next one I want to try is right below develop and that's enhance AI. The accent AI slider is designed to analyze your image and Luminar Neo will apply what it thinks your image needs. Sometimes that's increased contrast, maybe a little structure. So it's a combination of things that are happening under the hood. Let's see what it's doing. I think those are some good changes, but I don't want to add any extra contrast here. So I'm going to bring this one up quite high and we're going to mask it. So clicking the masking tab, I'm going to use the brush tool and I'm going to erase and I'm going to start with about 60 strength or opacity and just start removing it from this area because this area has more contrast than the rest. So I want to sort of apply this tool selectively, as I mentioned, to the rest of the image to try and have it help it catch up to this area because we've got lots of nice black here, like so. So see what that's doing? Now, while I'm here, I'm actually going to copy this mask. So go down under Mask Actions and copy it because I might want to apply that on another tool as well. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that this image is pure black and white and it doesn't have any tint. So I'm just going to use the black and white tool and convert it. Now we have a grayscale image, so we don't have to worry about any color tints. The next tool we're going to look at is actually landscape. The slider we're looking for here is dehaze. So even though this is not a landscape image, dehaze does a nice job of bringing back contrast when you have conditions that are foggy or smoky or cloudy. So similar to this image that's faded. Let's see what it does. See how that's working? I'm looking particularly in this lower left area of the car. Once again, I don't want it on this area. So I'm going to go to mask, mask actions, and this time paste. See how it nicely removed it? And if we show the mask, it's the same mask as I had last time. That's why I copied it so I didn't have to paint it again. Save yourself some work. So let's see what that's doing. That looks pretty good. Now let's go back to the develop tool again and try the smart contrast slider. Again, I'm particularly looking at this area of the car around here. I'm going to use the same mask one more time. So paste and I might bring it down just a little bit. I'm going to refine the mask even more because I think what I want to do is not have it so much on the house. So I'm going to erase again from this area because remember we're adding contrast and I don't necessarily want it up here. I always use the little eyeball icon on each tool to see a before and after of that tool and what it's doing to that image, right? So I can take a look and see, am I happy with these edits? Yes. While I'm in here, I can see if adding some more blacks helps. Yes, it does. Bringing the shadows down. Yes, that does as well. See how it's affecting the dark parts of the car and the ground. So it's eliminating some of that foggy look. We're getting really close. Another tool that you can use, especially if the image is faded around the corners or the edges, is the vignette tool. It's literally designed to darken the edges. So let's drag the amount slider down. And this is a little trick that I use when I'm vignetting is I bring the feather all the way to zero. And you can see that because we crop the image, we have to bring the size down. So I get the size I want it. Then I'm going to position it so that it's roughly in the middle, like so. And I want to darken this bottom part of the image, but I don't necessarily want to darken the top. So I can do that by making the size bigger and then just moving the vignette up. See how now it's only going to affect this bottom part. Let's bring the feather up. Can we see what that's doing now? It's darkening these bottom corners. I might even take it farther. So you could do this with the dodge and burn tool. You could do this with develop and then mask it in again. 
But the vignette tool does a great job on the edges. So consider using this one if you have faded corners. Let's take a look and see how far we've come on this image. Here's the before and after. See how much more contrast and punch it has now, bringing it back to life. One final tool I'm going to use is Structure AI. I'm just gonna take it all the way up to 100 and boost it just to show you what it does. It brings out edge detail. So I like what it's doing in some areas, but not in others. And obviously this is way too far. So I'm gonna bring it up a little bit and then just decide by masking using the brush and painting in this time. If you're not sure whether your brush is set for paint or erase, take a look at the middle of the cursor. Can you see that there's a plus sign there right now? That means paint. So that's adding the effect in wherever the brush touches. Press X on your keyboard. Now you see it's a minus sign. So that means it's going to take the effect away or erase it from wherever the brush touches. So in this case, I'm going to paint in using about 50% strength and just add a little bit of structure to this middle part of the image where I want to bring more attention. Something like that. Let's see how that plays out. I'm happy with that. Now, if your image has some flaws like this one, you're going to need to use the erase tool or the clone tool to get rid of some of these things. I noticed there's a corner up here, so we can use erase to just blend that a little bit. What I recommend on these kinds of images when you're using the erase tool is to do one little bit at a time. So things like this where there's lots of scratches and dust spots, you have to just do it meticulously bit by bit. But now can you see why I cropped off the right hand side of the image? It's just a make work project. If it's not needed or important to the image, crop it off. I've got another example image where I'm going to do a bit more erasing and cloning to show you how that works. So let's move on to the next technique. I've already done a bunch of editing on this image. Here you can see the before and after, including a crop. The original image was quite tall and it was just blank space. So as you can see, there's not much there and there's lots of damage at the bottom. If I zoom in here, you can see that there's lots of dust and fingerprints, and I think that's actually from the scan. There's also some damage up here. So I just chose to crop it into a four by five aspect ratio, which will then print nicely as an eight by 10. So I chose that aspect ratio purposely. Let me show you the edits that I've done here. I used the develop tool as we did on the last image and the vignette tool to darken the edges. And then I adjusted the color by bringing the saturation down just a little bit. The original image was a very light sort of sepia tone or brown tone. And when I enhanced the contrast, it became really yellow. So I just dialed the saturation down a little bit to keep it softer, like so. Then I did a bunch of erasing using the erase tool and the clone tool. I'm actually going to undo these and I'll show you how I applied them. Okay, now that the erase and the clone tools have been removed, you can see that there's lots of dust spots, both black and white on this image. This almost looks like fingerprints or something on the print that maybe it could have been a better scan, but needless to say, we need to fix that when we're doing our editing. You can see some dark bits up here. So let's go to the erase tool. The first thing I want to try is remove dust spots. It's an AI part of the erase tool and it looks for black spots on your image. So I'm going to run it and see if it can get rid of any of them for me automatically. I'm not sure if it did anything, but maybe it got rid of some of the smaller ones. Now, the only way to do this is painstakingly little by little. There's no shortcut. So regardless of what tool you're using, whether it's Luminar Neo, Lightroom, Photoshop, or something else, you have to just do it one by one. So let's get started. I'm gonna zoom in, and I'm gonna start with this black spot right here. I recommend the first time you apply the erase tool, just do one or two spots, click erase, let the tool apply it, and then continue. Then 
do the same thing for the next few. Just do a couple of spots here and there, and then click erase and let it apply. One in her hair. So I'm just going to do that a bit around the image and speed up the video so you can catch up to me when I've done a bit more erasing. Let's get started. Okay, I've done all the major ones and I've left a few areas to show you the clone tool instead. Because this area up here on the left corner, let me zoom in a little bit, you'll notice that I was at 200% sometimes when I was doing this. And when I zoom into 200%, you can see there's lots of little itty bitty black spots all over up here. So you really have to zoom in and move around the image to see all the spots and make sure you don't miss any. Right? So to move around, I just hold the space bar and then you get the hand and you can just click and grab to move it around. If you'd like to get a copy of my free Luminar Neo keyboard shortcuts cheat sheet, I'll put a link for that in the description area below for you. So this area here on the left looks kind of sandy. So I'm going to come back and use the clone tool on that area and on this area. So you can see it kind of looks dusty and a lot of this I think was actually due to there being dust on the print or on the scanner when the scan was done. So if you're doing the scans yourself, make sure that everything is clean, the print and the scanner surface so that you're not making more work for yourself later like this. So backing out to see the full image, you can see that quite a few spots have been removed. You don't see them all here, but when you zoom in, they're there. So I'm going to close the erase tool and move down to the bottom under professional where we find clone. The thing with the clone tool is you have to set the source first. So we need to zoom in, obviously. I'm going to start at 100% and I want to do this area over here because you can see there's a line and then some speckles over here. So you have to set the source, meaning where is it going to clone from? And then the second part is where it's cloning to. OK, so I'm just going to set this area. So I'm going to clone from left to right. So I'm going to click here. Right. Then I'm going to get a fairly large brush and I'm going to set the strength to 30. So I'm not cloning at full opacity. When you clone at full opacity, if you have any mistakes, it's going to show and be really obvious. Let me show you what I mean. So if I just click and clone, see how this area looks the same tone, but it's not. It's lighter. Now, even though we don't have a full functioning undo feature in Luminar Neo, when you're using the clone tool, guess what? You can undo. So, Command or Control Z or Z if you're American, and that takes you back one step. So, as long as the clone tool is open, you can still undo or redo. Okay. Once you close it, you won't get back to that option. Okay. So, that's a handy trick to know. So let's get back to the 30% clone that I was going to do. And I'm going to set my source. If you need to redo the source, just hold down the Alt Option key. And I'm just going to move slightly to the right. So I want to clone just ever so slightly from left to right. And I'm just going to go in a motion like this. Right? Now notice I made a boo-boo there because I cloned her hairpin. So I'm just going to undo. When you're cloning, change the source frequently. Now I'm going to go from here and go up, and then here and go down, here, up. Okay, so I'm changing the source so I'm not always cloning from the same direction. Because when you're cloning, you want to make sure you don't make it look fake and you end up with duplication. That's a key. Uh, mistake that a lot of people make when cloning is they get repetition of pattern and that's a major giveaway that you've done some cloning. So let's just see what this is doing. Okay. There's the before and after. Now I'm going to move over here. Oh, see I didn't have it all the way to the top so I got to go up here, check my corners. Okay, so I'm always having my finger on this Alt Option button and I'm constantly changing so that I'm cloning from a different direction. Okay, now I'm going to clone this way. 
to get rid of some of these black spots. And when I'm cloning at 30%, it kind of adds a blurriness, which in this case is okay, because we don't want these black spots to be sharp. We want them to go away. And this is actually doing a really nice job of sort of blurring them in, right? So we'll just keep going, keep changing the spot. This is the key. Always keep your finger on this button. Notice how often I'm pressing this button. Right? Let me zoom out. See that? We got rid of all of those nasty bits. Now let's do the bottom. To zoom in, just hold the space bar down and click on the image. Okay, now I'm going to do this bottom part. So I'm going to set my area. And I might even do a slightly larger brush. So now I'm just going to clone from right to left and then back left to right. So I don't want to lighten this area. I just want to get rid of those dust looking marks. You can see there's sort of a scratch in this bottom corner and I didn't erase it with the erase tool because I knew I was going to get it when I came in here with the clone tool. So I'm talking while I'm doing this, but notice that I'm frequently redoing which spot that I'm cloning from because right? I don't want to get a dark area over her blouse and I don't want to lighten any area that should be darkened. It's also good to back out and see your edits at full size. That looks good. Let's do this side, see if there's any issues over here. Close that. Now let's take a look at the full before and after. So you see how the clone tool softening the retouching a little bit actually blends in with the original background and the faded part at the bottom and is really realistic and believable. So in this case, the fact that the clone tool blurs works to our advantage. I wanna show you one more tip with this one because we can actually adjust the toning. If we don't like this color and you want a nicer sepia tone, we can just convert it to black and white, like so. You can also use these sliders if you want to adjust any of the tones. Then just scroll down and find the toning tool. And this is where you can add color to the shadows, right? So if you want a yellow, just pick something on the spectrum here. Drag up the saturation amount and the amount of the effect overall quite high so that you can see the color. If we want something a bit more orange or chocolate, we go more towards the left. If you want something more green, or you could even do a blue tone, okay? So totally up to you. I like this sort of orange look. And I like to add it in the shadows, but not overly saturated, just a little bit. So this is what I would call a warm black. Okay, so it's not pure black and white, and it's not pure sepia. This is what I call warm black and white. If you want to add it into the highlights as well, make sure that you note this number here on the hue scale, which is 54 in this case, and dial up the same number in the highlights. So then your tones will match. Otherwise, you'll end up with a duo tone, which is not bad, but if you want the same tint in the highlights, just make sure to match the number. Now to finalize this one, I'm just going to add a nice vignette and darken it so I can see again, bring the feather down, make it a little bit rounder because I've changed the shape of the image when I cropped it. Okay, so this is going to darken more on the bottom, which I'm fine with. Right, bring the feather up and then let's just darken. I feel like it needs a little more darkening on this corner, so I'm actually going to move it over a bit like that. Let's see what that does. Something like that. If I want this area darkened even more, we can go and use the Dodge and Burn tool. Make sure that when you are doing this and using this tool that you dial the strength down to around 10 to 12. No more than that. Never paint with the Dodge and Burn tool higher than that. If you do, you'll end up with sort of a mess. I like to use a large brush in this case and strength about 10 or 11. And I'm just going to do a couple of passes in this area here to try and even it out a little bit. Okay, so now we can literally paint in 
the texture of the background where we want it. We have to layer it, meaning bit by bit. So don't try to use the dodge and burn tool to paint it all in with one brush stroke. That's the mistake a lot of people make, right? Now you see what's happening. I'm getting some nice vignetting here, but we're getting a bit of texture picking up again. That's not a problem. All I have to do is apply this and go into the structure tool that we applied before. This time we're gonna take it minus. See what that does to the background? So I'm just gonna blur it a little bit and then use a mask and do a radial gradient so I can get it on her. Okay, so I'm erasing it. Wherever you see red is where this effect is going to apply. So I'm making sure not to blur her. Now you can see that is nicely blurring those edges again. Let's take a look at the fold before and after. If you want more color, you can just go back and change the toning tool. If we want to add a little more saturation, make it a bit more yellow, let's do that. Make sure to match your highlights, and then let's check it. I'm pretty happy with that. The next thing I wanna show you is how to fix sharpness issues. Look at the before image of this one. It's quite blurry. The original is not in focus. So trying to scan this photo, which is already a print of a negative, scanned, we're now on sort of the third generation copy, sharpening it is tricky. But I've done a pretty good job, right? It looks sharper than the original scan. Let me show you how I did it on another image. There's a few different ways to add sharpening. As we saw earlier, you can go to the develop tool and add some sharpness here, but it's not really doing anything to affect him. The next thing you can do is a little trick I developed, which is using the details tool. This one here, I'm gonna zoom in again. If you bring up the small details slider, it starts to make everything look sharper. This is what I did on the photo of the mom and the baby. Take a look at the before and after. It sharpened everything equally. You can also add some sharpening here with the sharpened slider. The thing I like about the details tool is that you can separate small, medium, and large details and affect them one by one. Notice that the large detail slider affects his suit and sharpens his suit up nicely. Small details affects the tree behind him, so maybe that's not something I wanna sharpen. Medium details affects his face more. So we might find a happy medium somewhere in the middle. So try all three sliders. Take them all the way one at a time, see what they do, and remember if you only want it to apply to a certain part of the image, just mask it in using the brush. I'm going to undo this one because I wanna show you one more tool that works really great. If you have the extensions for Luminar Neo, Super Sharp AI, I ran this one using Universal and Middle earlier on this image, and it did a great job. Let's see how it works. Here's the before and after. Look at the barn. The barn looks absolutely in focus. His face is way better. Now, if you don't want the tree in the background sharpened, you know what to do. Just mask it, use the erase tool, and erase it from the tree. You can also erase it from the sky because you don't really need to sharpen the sky. Now you can see that it's working on him and the barn really nicely. One caution I will give you is avoid using this Face Enhancer AI checkbox. It's designed for close-up portraits to enhance the face and smooth skin and so on. I would not use it on old photos like this. As a matter of fact, I don't recommend this Face Enhancer on any image. Just skip it. So here's a before and after. And then if we apply the same techniques that we did earlier and give this image more contrast, it's going to look even sharper. Because when you lack contrast, the image is flat and it lacks punch. It also makes it look blurry. So look what happens when we add some contrast. Now the image looks even sharper. In the latest version of Luminar Neo, update 1.8.0, we have the before and after slider back. 
So now you can see the big difference it's making here for and after. Let's take a look at what happens if you have an old color image to restore. What kind of problems or issues do you notice here? It's faded, it's off color, and the corners are blue. This is what I was able to do with it using the tools in Luminar Neo. Let's take a look. So the edits that I did to this one, if we go from bottom to top, I've showed you most of these already. So they applied to the black and white images, but it also works on the color image. So I adjusted the curve a little bit and the sliders here in the light section and blacks and whites. You can see the original and after. So that's just the develop tool. I also did some color adjustments here and how I was able to get this more neutralized is using the eyedropper. So click the eyedropper and then choose something that you think is neutral in the picture. So I chose the wall behind him. It came out a little bit pinker than I liked. So I just added a bit more yellow and took away some of the pink, but it was a good starting point using the eyedropper and got me closer than just trying to guess. The next tool that I used was the color tool. What I did here was I used the remove color cast slider and that just helps to kind of correct any weird tints. I find if you take it too high though, it starts to add too much contrast. So keep this one subtle. I also fixed some of the blue issues in the corners. So I used saturation slider. Make sure you open the HSL panel at the bottom like this. Go to saturation and blue, I just dialed it down. I could probably play with cyan as well. So it's probably a little bit of both in those corners. Then I did the same with luminance, darkened it. So a lot of those problems with the corners were fixed using this color tool. See that? Looks like there's some blue at the bottom as well. Now it is affecting his shirt a little bit, but it's actually added some contrast because the blue squares in his flannel shirt got darker. So it's actually a good thing. Next, I added a vignette. And once again, if we dial down the feather, you could see that I positioned it so that I affected just those corners again. Okay, so I'm darkening the corners even farther. Next, I still wasn't happy with the color, so I went to the mood tool. This is where you can apply a LUT. Also with update 1.8.0, we now have the ability to preview the LUTs on hover over. So I knew that there were some in the creative that I liked, so I literally just sort of scrolled through them and found one that I thought looked good. So I picked candlelight. Then you could see if I dial it up or down what it's doing. It's vignetting the image, giving it more of a central focus point. So it's actually doing a nice job on those corners as well as the color. Then finally, I did a little bit more with the dodge and burn tool on those top corners like you saw me do on the other image. From here, I would use the erase tool to get rid of some of these dust spots and scratches. One thing I am gonna mention in regards to this long looking like a scratch or hair over here, um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more, is to do it bit by bit again. Okay, so if you try and do this whole thing and do one brush stroke and erase it all at once, you'll find it's not gonna work so well. See, not so much, right? So I'm just gonna undo that. But let's see what happens if we just do a couple of spots at a time. And I find that doing like spots like that separate so that they're not touching works better. Right? So I'm gonna do a spot there and maybe a spot there. You see? So just do a little bit at a time. And I also find when you try to go over lines like that, that's where you run into problem. So do stuff like this, where you just come up to the edge of that wall. Okay, I'm gonna do this section here. Looking pretty good, right? Let's see if we can get this whole last bit of it, like so. Okay, so don't try to do it in one swipe. Do it little by little, spot by spot. And once again, the same will apply to the rest of these spots. 
You could try the clone tool, but I think the erase tool does a better job. You just have to be meticulous and get them all. This area here is where I might use the clone tool to try and match the wall a little bit better. But overall, take a look at the before and after. So you're never going to get the original vibrance of the original color image because it's been faded. But I've used the mood tool to bring back some of the warmth and the color tool to adjust the tint. One other tool that I didn't use here that we could use is toning. We use that on the black and white image, but you can use this on color images as well. For example, lots of times faded color images end up with blue shadows. So if you bring this up into the yellow zone, and if you're not sure what color you have, just take it sort of all the way and then adjust the color. That <laughs> actually looks pretty good. See how blue it is, the original? which I didn't even notice till I brought this slider up. Now look at the chair and the shadow appear more brown and overall the image is more pleasing. Sometimes you'll end up with um, a weird tint in the, in the highlights like a cyan tint or something like that. So again, play around with the hue slider. You may end up somewhere up in here and just adjust it until it's pleasing. I'm happy with that. The final thing I'm going to show you is what do you do if you have a really small original? This photo was very small, maybe only a couple of inches. So the scan itself is only 1500 pixels by 1500 pixels. It's not even really large enough to print. We could go back and scan it at a higher resolution, which I recommend. Scan at the highest resolution that you can, or we can try upscale in Luminar Neo. So to use Upscale, this is one of the extensions for Luminar Neo. You must have either the Pro Plan or have purchased the extensions to use this. And if you're doing a lot of photo restoration, this one would be worth it. Just grab the image. Oops, you have to be in the catalog view. So just grab the thumbnail, drop it into Upscale, and then choose how much you want to upscale it. In this case, I'm going to do six times. So I'm going to apply it and I'll be back to show you the result. When you use the upscale AI or focus stacking or HDR merge for that matter, it creates a new folder for you and drops it in there. You can see my HDR merged images there and upscale this image here. Now, when we look at it, we can see that the image is actually 9,096 by 9,042. So this is a printable size. If you zoom in, of course you're going to see lots of issues, but the original is not a great quality, so you have to set realistic expectations. If your original is ripped or out of focus or grainy or has sort of dust or spots all over it, don't expect your retouching and your final one to be perfect. You could never get it perfect, but it's about preserving memories and keeping those photos as heirlooms for your family not about perfection. So just do your best and set realistic expectations. This is actually an image of my husband's grandmother who was a nurse and we found out that she was actually into photography. So there's lots of photos of his family dating back a hundred years. So I've got my work cut out for me restoring family photos. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like more learning about Luminar Neo from me, check out Luminar Neo The Complete Course now. To watch another video on YouTube, there's a couple of suggestions for you on the side now. Until next time, good luck with your photo restorations.